Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. challenged the country to address the racial inequities baked into the American economy. In a speech given just weeks before he was assassinated, King spoke about the curse of poverty the federal government had cast on black Americans from emancipation. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, King noted, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. Land grants, federal subsidies, and low interest rates were all reserved for whites to build intergenerational wealth. King explained. In drumming up support for the Poor People's Campaign, King went on to promise that when we come to Washington, we're coming to get our check. That was 1968, when an average middle-class black household held approximately $6,600 in wealth, while a white household has $70,000, according to data from the Historical Survey of Consumer Finances. That extraordinary ratio of wealth gap has remained remarkably steady for 50 years. In 2019, the same survey shows an average white household is seven times richer than their black counterpart, holding $188,000 compared to a black household's $24,000. Commemorating Dr. King's legacy today, during a taped speech for the National Action Network, the U.S. Treasury Secretary invoked King's vision for economic justice and reflected on how the country has fallen short. It's obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. From Reconstruction to Jim Crow to the present day, our economy has never worked fairly for black Americans, or really for any American of color. Joining me now to discuss Derek Hamilton, economics and urban policy professor at the New School. So, uh, Professor Hamilton, the, Yellen was talking about, kind of passively, that the American economy has never worked equally for people of color. But King was talking about the government actively working against equality, actively giving out more benefits to people who were not black than to those who were. Talk about that differential. I mean, you are spot on. It's more than economy not working for black people. Government has been complicit. Government has facilitated a structure by which black people have been vulnerable to exploitation, predation. And in comparison, when you look at some of the programs that you described initially, that when you cited King, government has facilitated the wealth and asset accumulation for white individuals. Let, let me say one other thing real quick. A lot of this show that you've had so far is focused on political rights. Dr. King knew quite well that the other component to human rights beyond civil and political rights was economic rights, a role for government to ensure that people had adequate resources so that they can engage in society with dignity. One of the, the biggest uh, kind of builders of wealth for a family is home ownership. But according to a study published in 2020, the black home ownership rate fell to 41% in 2019, which is the lowest level since the 1968 Fair Housing Act. It hit 44% in a recent quarter, still below the high 50% in 2004. Why has there been so little movement around black home ownership? over the decades? Well, pretty much the mechanism to get into home ownership is a down payment. And what's been true, not only for that 50 year that you cited, but throughout American history is that black people en masse have never had access to resources or wealth or assets, which would put you in a home. So basically it is wealth that begets more wealth. And we might have slight fluctuations through various programs, sometimes predatory, like subprime mortgages that provide greater access. Um, but ultimately, the most critical ingredient is that black people have not been, uh, had the luxury to be able to have assets and accumulate assets because they don't have capital. Do you think that there's, do you think that there's also some sense of being burned? You know, there was a push, ironically, during the Bush years for more home ownership, but that was also when the mortgage companies were engaged in this predatory lending. And so 
that push, you know, a lot of people bought houses. They moved out into the suburbs. They got their Big Mac mansions. And then it all came crumbling down. And a lot of people, black people, were hurt by that. Do you, do you think there's any gun-shy sensibility around that at this point? I mean, you bring up another issue, which is uh, the vulnerability that black people have when they engage in finance, that they haven't had the political protections to guard them against subprime mortgages that, uh, frankly, are predatory. It's not about information. Clearly, a bank has a great deal more asymmetric or disproportionate information than a consumer does when they engage in a transaction. And uh, we, we've had a structure of when black people have been able to accumulate resources that's been vulnerable. And you cited uh, the Bush years. You know, I'll even add and say prior to that, if we look at the, the Clinton years, we saw that home ownership started to tick up for black people and it ratcheted more during the Bush years. But it was the result of predatory products when even when black people had the income and the resources, they did not get the same loans as white people. And, 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 and I'm sorry to, if I'm droning on, but just to be clear, mm -hmm. this is not just about economic power, it's about political power. So not only have they not had the economic resources, when they engage in transaction with finance or with any other type of entity, they have not been afforded the same legal and political protections as their white counterparts. Let's switch the subject a little bit here. In 1967, Dr. King spoke about the need for a guaranteed income, and he said this, we must develop a program that will drive the nation to a guaranteed annual income. We must create full employment or we must create incomes. People must be made consumers by one method or another. What do you make of the push for universal basic income as a tool for closing the wealth gap? Well, you know, for clarity, I'm a fan of guaranteed income, but not UBI. Uh, the universality of basic of universal basic income can become problematic for technical reasons. If you literally give everybody the same amount throughout the whole economy, it's almost the definition of inflation. And you unintendedly will exacerbate inequality because if you're at the high end of the distribution, you're basically subsidizing their wealth portfolio because they have enough resources to meet their consumption needs, and then you just subsidize their assets. But I'm well with King. And, and, and by the way, let me give you a compliment. Uh, it, you deserve many, but one big one is how this show comes together. So you had the Bishop Barber on earlier, who is one of the co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign. And this uh, is a you know continuation from King's legacy when they're both are talking about guaranteed income and guaranteed jobs, federal job guarantee and guaranteed income. And here's the point. Government has a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that people have economic rights. And what better way to address poverty than to abolish it altogether? Make sure that everybody has adequate income so that they can engage. And we can get into conversations that the conservatives will put forth about, does it deter work? Does it lead to disincentives from people to be their best selves? That has not empirically been borne out, and it frankly is grounded in racism. It's grounded in a notion of who's deserved right. and who's not deserved. But the reality is that for people ultimately to have power, they need some resources. So if you want to go to work and you don't have child care, mm -hmm. then you're limited in your capacity to go to a job. But just having some basic right. needs like income is what we need for our human existence. Derek Hamblin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Very illuminating conversation. I really appreciate it.